This is Mother Baby Daddy. I am Dr. Tanya. My guest today is Dr. Karen Alkine Hirsch. Karen, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us what you've been up to. So understanding that, I I sort of, when I went to Baylor, I went to the medical school to do research again in women's health. I was in the OBGYN department. I actually got an appointment in the endocrine department as well, in the medicine department, because they were so interrelated. And I wanted to learn more about the insulin, the diabetes side of things, not just the reproductive, because I felt like they were so connected. And so that's where all my training kind of came from. Then I left, went to Women's Hospital, which is a huge tertiary hospital. We do about eight thousand deliveries so we're huge we are huge one of the other things about living back in louisiana which you know where i had trained before is um obviously our obesity epidemic and the sequela that goes with that and one of the things when i began working and i was still doing fertility working with pcos but once you get these women pregnant many of them develop gestational diabetes and when i was at baylor i had done some work with the diabetes people on gestational diabetes but much more at the level of the placenta and understanding the regulation of pregnancy during gestational diabetes and how it was different if you were controlled or uncontrolled. But when I was there, you know, one of the things I began to notice is that we had this huge population. We, most places, they say 4 to 7% gestational diabetes. We have 11 to 14% of gestational diabetics. Oh, yeah. So it's 8,000 soldiers. You're talking about almost 1,100 women with GDM. And our population is about 60 Caucasian, sort of 40% white. We now have more. We're beginning to increase our Hispanic population since Katrina, but it still is predominantly African American and Caucasian. And one of the things I began to notice is that the women after they had gestational diabetes, their insulin and glucose dynamics, which is what I look at, and that's sort of my expertise, and it's testing that I brought to the hospital with me to kind of help predict the progression, diabetes, and how we treat it look very similar. So for me, it was almost an easy way to jump from PCOS to gestational diabetes, more post-gestational diabetes. But with that came the understanding of what they look like all the way through. So, you know, it was like following the same patient from the time she was diagnosed through her pregnancy. Then more importantly, in that what I call the fourth trimester, which is sort of forgotten. So we have first trimester, second, third, and we forget about the fourth one, which is after the baby's delivered, but before you really return to normal. It's a really forgotten period. It's something we're working on developing a fourth trimester clinic because this is not unique to GDM. It's also women with hypertension. It doesn't go away. So one of the biggest things I think that my take home message was, was that there was this fallacy that you got gestational diabetes, right? And you had the baby, it was gone, That's right? right. Okay, that is, that is like, okay, now mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you that if you go back and again, in my Boston training back to Jocelyn in the 1800s, okay, so the father of diabetes, Jocelyn, Jocelyn Clinic. He showed that in women who had gestational diabetes, that 10 or 15 years later, they were more likely to develop diabetes, okay? So he already recognized that connection. But we kind of like, we're like, ah, oh, you're done, bye, you know, yeah. see you later, right? Yeah, that's right. And so that was kind of, and that is, that kind of a mindset is what I have spent 10 years trying to change, right. okay? And maybe in the field, it's very obvious. If you look at the literature and translating it all into pregnancy, you know, in diabetes prevention we're all cognizant of it but in the practitioner world i think unfortunately the OBGYNs are really not set up or trained to what do you do with this patient after she delivers right yours like bye do your pap smear bye see you in a year or see you whenever get you on your contraception or whatever you're not there trying to manage her her now is the fact that she just got the best lab test in the world what i call because remember i am a laboratorian which was called pregnancy yeah <laughs> better than any test i can do in a lab I always say this to everybody. This is the best test that of stressing your body. What happens when your body gets stressed? Because those it's the hormones of pregnancy, it's the weight of pregnancy, it's the combination that now stresses the body. And if your body can't compensate, okay, and fix that sugar, okay, that's a red flag. Just like it can't fix like your hypertension or something. It's a red flag. It's telling you you're not okay. It's kind of if I took you, and, and the problem is we don't normally take young women and do a glucose tolerance test on them. Let's just stop something we do it's i mean we're better now many people are doing glycohemoglobin something we didn't do before glycosylated hemoglobin a1 hba1c we're doing it certainly in our older population but you know we're picking up sort of our pre-diabetics a little bit 
better. Um, it's not the best test, but it is a beginning. But routinely, we just don't do it. Though. Even the OBGYN is not going to run an A1C on a non-pregnant female, you know, unless she has some horrible history. So, uh, I mean, the, the thing is, that was that is a great red flag that you now can, you have something, you have a propensity. It doesn't mean you're going to become a diabetic, but you may have to change your lifestyle. You may need to look at, you know, how do I now change what I do so I don't stress this out and become a diabetic. And a lot of that has to do primarily, number one, losing the baby weight, okay? Mm -hmm. That is by far and foremost the biggest variable.